With Gordon Price today, we have other members of the Vancouver City Council, um, and we have some staff here as well. I wonder if you could stand so that we could uh, acknowledge you. Good. Thank you for coming. I, I understand they have a full schedule while they're here in Portland, so we appreciate them all coming uh, and visit, visiting with us today. Uh, Gordon Price grew up in Victoria, spending much of his youth kayaking in the rivers of British Columbia. It's hardly the type of upbringing that you would expect of somebody who grew up to be a champion of inner city living. But along the way, he spent some time in New York City and San Francisco, and although these areas are obviously densely populated, he saw that you could have a vibrant and fun life in these big cities. He also came to recognize that by enabling more people to live in the cities, uh, you would end up protecting the wilderness that he loved. Mr. Price has been on the Vancouver City Council since 1986 and has been a leader in the restructuring of Vancouver as chair of the Standing Committee on Planning and the Environment and the Standing Committee of Transportation and Traffic. He also is a director of strategic planning for the greater Vancouver area. Gordon Price will talk to us about the efficiencies he and his colleagues on the Vancouver City Council have been able to achieve as a result of densification. Now they, like us, are faced with a rapidly growing population without the ability to expand their boundaries. Now they're also trying to reduce their, uh, their dependence on the automobile for transit. We've been slowly introducing residential living into the edges of our downtown in the Pearl District and perhaps the soon to be developed North McAdam District, but Vancouver has been able to achieve instant residential living by rezoning blocks from commercial use to mixed use, thereby permitting office buildings to go condo, a phenomenon that we haven't seen yet in Portland. We'll have to consider the kinds of things that Vancouver has undertaken as we try to fit our bulging population into the urban growth boundary. A city club research study is now underway on the infill issue, but before that report comes out, the program committee thought it would be interesting to get the perspective of someone who has had to deal with perhaps even a faster population growth than we have seen in Portland. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Gordon Price. Thank you, Peter. That was just an excellent introduction. Ditto for my speech. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's great to be here. Uh, this is really a, something I have been looking forward to for a very long time, to address the City Club of Portland. You know, because I do consider myself to be partially a Portlander. I have the hat. <laughs> Pendleton fedora. Right? Maybe just a little too Indiana Jones, but yeah. it's my colleagues with Boach. I do wear this. Keeps your head warm, the rain off. It's very much what I always associate when I'm thinking about how cities work. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I've actually spent a lot of time here. I've been coming down regularly since 1986. And um, yes, I can pronounce the name of the river, damn it. And I, I can even name all the bridges from the Selwood to the St. John's in order. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> and uh, you can ask later. if. <laughs> That's because I have spent so much time in the neighborhoods on the other side, and anyone who lives on the East Bank has their set of bridges. I have spent some time in a little courtyard apartment off Hawthorne, in the garret of a grand old house in Irvington, and in a bungalow in Buckman. And I have seen the quirky renaissance of Hawthorne at Pasta Works and Broadway South, Northeast at 15th, and now Belmont at the Dairy. And of course, just love that bungalow belt from the Alameda Ridge down to Lad's Edition and beyond, but that's the part I know well. And here I am to talk about Vancouver density. Folks, you got it working great already over there. You think about 
about that remarkable collection of intact neighborhoods. There's heritage and tradition at densities, sure, a lot of automobile use, but transit works. It's in walking distance of a lot of services. It houses a remarkable mix of people. And I suspect when you include in all the illegal suites, <laughs> the density is pretty high. <laughs> that works well. We have similar streetcar neighborhoods because that's, that's what they are. They're the heritage that we've received from the streetcar era. And we haven't actually come up with a much better model for ground-oriented housing that still supports that single-family character that is so much a heritage, so loved by so many people. And if we could only just keep providing it, eh? If there was just simply a way to do that. But that's not the way it works. It's not my favorite part of Portland, though. That's Forest Park. Forest Park, yeah. I think I have run all of Wildwood from the Vietnam Memorial to Germantown Road. Not in one day, but I think I've done it all. And uh, I've done the Hood to Coast twice. Pretty proud of that. I can remember one leg uh, somewhere near Scapoose around five in the morning, uh, looking back to Mount Hood, and there it was in that pale pink light of dawn, just rising out of those misty blue-green hills. Well, that puts Oregon in your blood. That's why it's something more than just a place to visit. It really is a place to love. And I have admired your leaders. I know why you named a bridge after Glenn Jackson, and why there are so many buildings named Hatfield, and why Bill Roberts is honored on the bus mall, and even what Ira Keller said when he inaugurated the Portland Development Commission, because you put those words on a plaque in front of the Four Court Fountain, which I believe an architectural critic called the finest urban space since the Renaissance. Well, there are so many things to admire in what you've done with the meticulous beauty of downtown. Now, I have also seen, <laughs> I have also seen the strip mall sprawl of 82nd Avenue, and I, um, <laughs> I don't even have to talk about Clark County, but I do know that that has taken a lot of pressure off the urban growth boundary. And I have seen less successful efforts at densification. Townhouses that, gosh, just don't quite work for the street, and and apartment buildings that, well, less than successful. Let's say that. I have spent a lot of money at Powell's, I want you to know that, and I've tasted a lot of pizza and beer at the Bridgeport, and I have not yet tasted every brew, brew at every McMinimums, but hey, <laughs> who could keep up? <laughs> My first memory is actually of Lloyd's Center. I remember this very well. Now, you have to imagine in when it opened, what was this, about 61? when a Canadian family was coming down the new interstates for that mecca at the other end that they call Disneyland, when you came to Portland, of course you stopped at the biggest shopping center in the world. Of course. And of course you actually didn't go into downtown Portland, because why would you? There wasn't much there. And with the Fremont and the Markham Bridges, there were all kinds of reasons to pass it by. So when I came back to Portland, I guess it was in about the mid-70s, mid to late 70s. Well, of course you went downtown, because that's where the heart of Portland was. Pioneer Courthouse Square. That's where, that's where the heart was. That's where I began to realize this city was different. And I have spent some time to try and figure that out. I know you are celebrating the 25th anniversary of the downtown plan, and so you should. The benefits that came out of the decisions of that era are astonishingly remarkable, and I suspect many of you are now aware of that. In almost every respect, the downtown plan achieved what it set out to do. But what is most remarkable looking as an outsider was how it came about. that confluence of consensus from your political leaders, business, and community could pursue their self-interests, but at the same time recognize the needs of the other and come up with something that worked. 
I'd love to actually go into more detail about the downtown plan. I had the opportunity to do that at an AIA panel, and I'm awfully glad I went and researched it because it is a truly remarkable story. And I came to realize, of course, so much else happened in that period in the early 1970s with the failure of the Rose City Transit TriMet under Bill Roberts, of course, the Transit Mall, under Glenn Jackson, the Waterfront Park. Lots of people now, of course, take responsibility. Success has a thousand parents, and you have been blessed by a particularly good set of parents. Pioneer Courthouse Square, revitalized historic districts, the Performing Arts Center, both additional parking and a parking limit. You know, that's an incredible list. And I, I have to wonder then, uh, because I've been watching your politics closely as well, I've been wondering about what is exactly happening to the electorate. Why, with that history of outstanding leaders and such a record of accomplishment by government, is there the seeming determination to undermine what we would call, I think, representative democracy? Term limits, double majorities, these ever-constraining initiatives. They seem to be doing the opposite of what you want, to some degree. This may be a presumption of an outsider, but does anyone understand your property tax system anymore? I can't imagine they could. And yet, isn't it ironic, in an attempt to try and, and constrain government, it has actually produced a kind of regulatory, Byzantine, complex, and confusing system that it's going to take a lot of work to try and straighten out. And I wonder today whether Hector McPherson and Tom McCall could actually get together to craft Senate Bill 100 and create LCDC. Well, maybe, you know, because your leadership is still, in my opinion, very, very strong. You benefit by doing things, and most recently I heard Charlie Hale say this on the radio last night, you do things the Oregon way, and you have a sense of what that is. In fact, looking back, when great men from outside have strode across your state, it always hasn't been to your interest. I can't think of a better example than Robert, when Robert Moses showed up in 1943 and told you how to build for the coming era of the interstates. And now you've ended up with a lot of concrete on the east bank of the river. Portland Improvement, it was called. And I doubt it was what Oregonians really had in mind, but I suspect it all happened so fast. You woke up. And there was the greatest public works project in human history, the interstate freeway system. If you go out to I-5, take a left, and just keep going north, you'll come to Vancouver when you hit a stoplight. Because we didn't build the freeways. At the same time, you were making those remarkable series of decisions in the early 70s. We made a remarkable one, the most important thing we didn't do. We didn't build freeways, at least within the 44 square miles of the city of Vancouver. Don't want to kid you. You can find freeways, and you can find sprawl in metropolitan Vancouver, but you won't find it in Vancouver. The central area of my city is really a very much a visual conundrum. This is the point where I show you the slides, so you're going to have to... <laughs> you're going to have to imagine, and you've probably seen the postcard image, all those towers kind of Looks like a little like Hong Kong, some people think. Don't even come close to those kind of densities, but we are certainly denser and more modern than almost any other city, more than any other city in the western half of North America. And yet, we function, this is key, we actually function like a big town before the modern era, really before the dominant use of the automobile. We are a city that builds ourselves around those streetcar villages that we put in place in the 1890s and around a grid system of arterial roads that were built out in the 1920s. And we've lived with them ever since. We just decided, in fact, the province just decided a few weeks ago, we're going to stick with our suspension bridge that gives access to the North Shore. It's actually smaller in capacity than the St. John's. Reached its design capacity in 1958, and we finally decided we're just going to upgrade it, paint it up, repair the bridge deck, and we're going to live with that. Because ever since, we decided not to build for the automobile, and we've been constraining it now in a whole bunch of ways for about 30 or 40 years, we've ended up with one of the most livable 
and prosperous inner city environments in North America, and that's not a coincidence. That is not a coincidence. Our central area is really more analogous to San Francisco, perhaps, Manhattan. Tight central business district, government, retail, culture, the arts, business, surrounded within walking and transit distance by these very dense residential neighborhoods. Those are all those towers you see, edged by water next to a very nice park. Mixed use works like gangbusters. And so let me share you a little bit about what we've learned from that. Ever since, well, since 1956, that we decided we would try to make high density livable. We've learned in that time, I think, that you can not only provide a good choice for people, but you take the pressure off a lot of existing neighborhoods. This is, I think, something that's often forgotten. The growth is coming. If you accommodate it, it's what, hap what doesn't happen in other neighborhoods that's just as important as what ha does happen in the place where you decide to put the growth. Of course, you attract investment. And I would say certainly in the last 10 to 20 years, we've learned that you can get an immense amount of public benefits at no cost to the taxpayer for the private investment. And for what that private investment pays for those public benefits, they add value to their investment. It's the quid pro quo. Yes, developer, you have to build a park, but that park is the amenity that you're selling when you attract people to buy your condos. That's how that works. And I've tried to think of how I can give you a compact way of understanding how that works, and I think I do. I'm going to be moving for the first time in 20 years down into one of these new neighborhoods. We call them mega projects. Sometimes 60 to 100 acres comprehensively planned and zoned. It's a great advantage to doing that. You can do it all at once. Great disadvantage to that. You do it all at once. You know? Hmm. So, and you take a risk. You take a risk. But let me describe, if I can, just what my personal situation is going to be. I'm moving to the ninth floor of a 23-story tower. Now, it's two parts. It's a podium and a tower. And the podium is going to look, a lot does look, a lot like actually an old brick warehouse. Because it's really part of a heritage neighborhood. Imagine the Pearl District taken right down to the banks of the Willamette. And you've got an idea. And you're actually getting buildings, Mackenzie Lofts, for instance, that look like that. Now then take a high-rise tower, add on about another 19 stories. Very slim, designed and sculpted to take advantage of the views. That's kind of what it looks. Wouldn't be out of place in a city like New York, except in my opinion it's better designed than most of what I see in New York building. Across the street from me, well, the inevitable Starbucks, sure. But in the empty lot to the west is going to be a boutique hotel built by the same chap who built the vintage. So it's adding another dimension of use to the neighborhood. In fact, my neighborhood is very mixed use. And it's 10 minutes by bicycle, 15 to 20, I suppose, by walking. It's a, a couple of transit routes and a little ferry that will take me across False Creek. It would be like going, say, from Waterfront Park to Omsi. I've got choices. Lots of taxis nearby. And lots of parking in the basement, underneath, not visible. In fact, there are no surface parking lots anywhere visible in my neighborhood. Just around the corner, shops, lots of them. Bank, dry cleaner, restaurants, pretty much everything I need from day to day. Very wide sidewalk built next to a major boulevard and double row of trees. Beautiful brick, not as good as what you do here. Don't have those beautiful lampposts. In some ways, the quality isn't as high as what Portlanders do, but it's good, and it's an attractive place to walk. On the top of the podium, all landscaped. In fact, when I look down on all this development, I actually see a greener city than the person on the street, because all the roofs, tops are landscaped, and on most of them, there's a little children's play area, equipment for the children. 25% of the housing has to be designed for families with children. That means there's play spaces on those floors and there is a safe place to take the kids. And in the park across the street, another play area. Actually, the most of the kids and parents choose to go. Right next door is the public housing project, social housing we call it. It's for families, particularly mothers with kids and seniors. And except for maybe a little bit more stucco and the fact that the building is lower, you can't tell it 
from mine, it's pretty much indistinguishable, which is just the way we like it. Now, across the boulevard, the community center. Used to be the old roundhouse for the train yards that were all along False Creek. It's been refurbished and expanded. The cost was 6.6 .6 million. It was paid for by the developer and turned over to the park board, along with the adjacent seven acre park on the waterfront that had to be built to the standards of the park board, paid for by the developer. And next to it, soon to open, is going to be the Roundhouse Children's Center, paid for by the developer, room for 60 kids. Will be turned over to a nonprofit that the city helps fund as well. It, in turn, is going to be integrated into the school site that was provided by the developer, which will be serviced by the $52 million in infrastructure, the water, the roads, the sewer lines, paid for by the developer. In fact, on the downtown peninsula, when we add it all up, we're going to see about another 50 acres of park space, almost all of it, paid for by either development cost charges or as part of the contract that we write for these mega projects. And that's not including the miles of seawall that have to be provided. Guess who has to pay for it? And then turned over to the city. You know, you come up to City Hall and there's not a negotiation as to whether the waterfront is going to be public. It's just the degree to which it will be public and what you have to pay to outfit it. The bike routes, for instance. Actually, we ended up creating one of the world's best rollerblading routes. Never planned for that. Just kind of happened. It's hard to put numbers to all these amenities. Some of them actually don't have price tags, but we figure, oh, about a quarter billion dollars worth of public amenity paid for by the developers. Now, they're going to make money. Well, we sure hope they are, because there is no point putting these requirements on the development process unless the developer is able to make money, they won't build it. But we do believe that having provided all of this, and it's reflected in the advertising, you know, they are advertising the fact that all of that amenity exists, is going to make money for them. And even in the downturn that we're experiencing at the moment, looks so far, looks good so far. At the end of my street now, there is a seawall, and I can, as I say, take the ferry across False Creek to, to City Hall if I want, or I can turn left and join with the bikeway and greenway network that will connect me practically to any other point in the city without ever having to use an arterial. Or I can turn right, and it will take me along the seawall and our new bike paths all the way to Stanley Park, which is really the soul and the heart of the city. There's public art there, not loved by all, but it's there. And there's a full-service, medium-sized supermarket under construction. I really want to emphasize that. I have learned you don't have a neighborhood until you've got a full-service, medium-sized supermarket. It takes about 10 to 15,000 people before someone is going to sign the lease. 10 to 15,000 people in walking distance, and that's about no more than hmm, three Portland blocks. That's a lot of people, if they're going to be within easy distance. And if you want to know what it looks like, it looks a lot like what you see in those postcards in the West End. To get the densities up to the point where all of those things that we say we want, walkable, transit-oriented neighborhoods, mixed use, with housing opportunities for a variety of people, that's what it begins to look like. And that can be pretty scary for some people. Fascinated by what I've read in the Willamette Week this week about how the jobs are out there and the people are living down here. Boy, you can't win for losing, can you? <laughs> what I thought was fascinating was the chap who works out in Hillsboro and wants to live downtown in the Pearl District, and he's only able to do that because you're building West Side Rail. Terrific! Absolutely fabulous from the transit system's point of view, as you can imagine, because they have to deadhead those trains anyway. Now they've got paying customers. And it's true. You don't necessarily get the people living in my neighborhood who all work downtown. A lot do. About half, at least. But they now have a range of choice and an opportunity to live in a high amenity area that they never could have imagined before with lots of transportation choice. They may have to indeed drive to work against the traffic initially. Traffic's going everywhere these days. But for all those other choices, walking to the supermarket, 
cross the street to the Starbucks, and no more than 30 minutes walk to the full range of services, everything that we can provide in the downtown peninsula, Central Library, two stadia, theaters, rest, well, you know the list, because you got it. Portland has won that battle. You've got one of those kind of cities. Do you have an affordable city? And that's the question we get asked. You have to be careful about what you consider to be affordable. Um, I actually do earn below the regional average in terms of income. That's what they pay me, the taxpayers. I'm grateful for it. I don't have a car. And it's by choice. It's not for environmental consciousness. It saves me about $8,000 a year. That's what the Canadian Automobile Association tells me is the average cost of buying and maintaining a car. That $8,000 is going into the quality of life that I can afford downtown. A location-specific mortgage, if I needed it, and transportation choice. For people, lower middle income, who are the majority of the people who live on the downtown peninsula, that's a reality at a higher quality of life than I suspect they can find in most places, inclu including access to nature. What an illustration this city is when you planted a forest, a veritable forest of trees, filling up all those streets. You now, I think, could argue that someone is closer in touch with the presence of nature if they live in the heart of the city than in a strip mall suburb out there in the urban edge. In fact, isn't it possible to offer what people want in the suburbs downtown, and isn't that the challenge? Clean, green, safe, and good schools with a range of housing choice, with a range of transportation choice. It's a dynamite combination. Not for everyone. And if someone doesn't like it, please don't move into it. But for those who do, there it is. How many of you have children under the age of 18 living at home? Hands up. And how many don't? <laughs> now, Vancouver is by no means a utopia. Uh, I've got to say that right away. We're dealing with a lot of issues. Without those freeways, you know, this bypass freeway system you've got is one of the reasons why people don't have to obey the traffic signals, the don't walk and walk signs on downtown streets. The bypass traffic is on those freeways. As congested as they are, at least it's not downtown. And when you're relying on an old grid, that's the reality for Vancouver. It's just not a reality that we can meet. We cannot provide people with what the advertisements are telling them they're supposed to be having. That is being able to drive without the excessive presence of a lot of other cars. That's not part of the deal. Yeah, we have a big drug problem these days. It's one of the reasons we're down here. We're going off to the DA's office after this just to find out some of the innovative responses that, that you're pursuing. We have uh, leaky condos. That's a big issue there. Uh, you got to watch the quality of construction. Some advice we can give you. And yep, we have insensitive development and hypersensitive communities. Sound familiar? And you got to deal with that. But we have faced the challenge of accommodating surges of population without sacrificing the neighborhoods valued by previous generations. I have a sense here that you are maybe trying to do too much within the established neighborhoods in order to accommodate density. The strategy that we've pursued is identifying areas, what we call let go industrial areas, opportunities for comprehensive planning, establishing what the ground rules are, the development cost charges, the public benefits, concentrating the density and making sure that we do that right. But your challenges, you know, you're going to have to do in the Oregon way to accommodate growth that would otherwise spill over into those sacred spaces in the Willamette and the Tualatin Valleys, the Gorge, the forests. Well, you've got so many opportunities I was interested again to hear Charlie Hales talking about brownfield sites and the opportunity that you're going to have to establish new ways of dealing with that here. Looks like you're already on to identifying it. There's no doubt that people are going to want to come into the heart of your city. Uh, you've won that battle, as I say, and in fact, I would note that you've already got enough precedents to indicate, boy, if anything, you're going to have a hard time keeping up. Real estate figures here. 
some interesting figures. The Portland Plaza condominiums. Hmm. 200,000 American dollars for a condo. The American Plaza in what I'd call the modern district, the uh, South Auditorium Renewal District, two to three hundred thousand dollars. It's American dollars, guys. <laughs> you know what that means? So, whoa. <laughs> you know, when I look at the modern district, that 54 blocks of urban renewal that Ira Keller was responsible for creating, I bet it's one of the little unknown secrets about living downtown, and I bet the people who live there don't want you to know about it. It must be pretty close to heaven. You know, it's really quiet over there, beautifully landscaped, um, some mixed use, but everything is walkable. It's in Fairless Square. You know the only problem that I can really see with it? By the way, I'd put a heritage designation on it. It is one of the absolutely pristine, intact, successful versions of urban renewal, and that's worth recognizing, but what I do think is missing is enough people. Here's the key. Don't confuse height and density. You know, you look at a high building and you think, whoa, dense. No. Nope. You can squeeze it all down. In fact, the buildings around here are probably on, on average twice as dense, these old streetcar apartments, as anything in the modern district, those high-rise towers. You don't have enough people in the modern district for a full-service, medium-sized supermarket, I don't think. And it's one of the reasons why when you go there, there's almost a feeling of sterility. No people on the streets. It's not dense enough. Odd, isn't it? Because when people look at it, I suspect today, they think it was maybe a mistake because you were piling people up in little concrete boxes in the sky. Jane Jacobs, in that book that reads as well today as it did when she wrote it in the early 60s, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, said, people confuse high density and overcrowding. They think they're the same things. You know, high density, overcrowding. No. No, overcrowding is too many people in too small a space. They are the kind of places that people want to get out of. And indeed, if you look at the history of North America and most places around the world, give people the opportunity to find space and they'll take it. But they may well search out a high-density community to do so because it offers them, well, I hope I've described, for me anyway, all those values and amenities and opportunities and choices that you can only get in those kind of environments. High density is not overcrowding. High density is something that you can aspire to, to do well. And you've got an obligation to do so because our expectations, speaking as a, a non-Portlander, are very, very high. You have done so many things so well. We just now expect you to do a really good job in the Oregon way of what it is that will take the pressure off your existing neighborhoods, accommodate the surges in growth that are going to be greater than Vancouver, can pretty much promise you that or warn you about it because I think you're no longer the place that hasn't been discovered. I have no doubt you are going to maintain the traditions that you've established in the 1970s and well for instance to even just reference one the urban growth boundary will you keep it? Here's a wine list from Jake's uh, let's see red wines northwest looks like there's about 13 of 13 wines. Ten of them are Pinot Noirs from Oregon. I've seen menus where they tell me, you know, the farm that the lamb came from and the river the fish came from. You relate now to that cornucopia through your stomach. And that's the place that people really do gain a bond with the landscape. <laughs> I have no doubt that you are going to maintain that lovely environment that is now so productive and so meaningful. So the challenges are absolutely clear. I don't have to reiterate them. You do a wonderful job of talking about them yourselves. What I will say is that you do have an opportunity to come to my city not to show you how to do it. You can learn certainly lessons from us, but you may find things that will work for you. So. Let me just end with one example. Well, let me land with a few. Let me just give you some advice on, on what to watch out for in Portland. Watch out for teardown. When your land values get to the point where the house now is a very minor part of what the value is, people will start tearing down the houses regardless of their quality because they don't reflect the value of the land. So neighborhoods that you think no one with any sensitivity would move into and demolish, they will do. 
The developer will do it because that may be the only way that he can get his land value back. Watch out for that. Be prepared. Design guidelines will help a lot, at least if something is coming down. Your neighborhood should feel comfortable that what replaces it will be as good, if not better. Take the pressure off existing neighborhoods. I've mentioned that already. Uh, you've got to provide good alternatives, quiet, clean, green, safe, good schools. When densifying, learn from your precedents. Ever heard of the Bowman apartment buildings? Anyone familiar with those? If you're in Irvington and Portland Heights, you probably know them. There are four plexes and six plexes. Many of them look better than the houses around them. They are tucked into these communities so elegantly, and yet they are medium density housing. No parking. Problem. Parking. Get your parking underground. Yep, I know the numbers sometimes don't work. If I had a single criticism of what I see with your medium density apartment buildings is that the parking is still at grade, or in the case of the townhouses, basically destroy the streetscapes in order to accommodate them, it doesn't work very well, does it? Vancouver has been fortuitous, partly because of our high land values, that it's worth getting that parking underground, and once you've done that, then the fabric begins to fit together of that big town before the modern era, it works. It's a little more expensive. And an opportunity. Let me just tell you one that's kind of my favorite, and this is presumptuous because here's an outsider. Um, living in Buckman, trying to figure out how to get to the waterfront. It's a real challenge. There's no obvious way. They don't tell you. Greenways and bikeways, well, you're putting in the bike routes, it's true, the lanes, but what I'm looking for is that seamless connection off the arterials that will get me on foot or blade or bike from one part of the city to the other. When I was struggling through it, I looked when I came to Grand Avenue and I thought, wow, what a neat area. This is Grand Avenue at Morrison, where the Waverly Building is, that tall deco white tower that you see on the East Bank. Hmm. Gosh, if you built podiums that reflected the heritage quality and filled in the empty sites, and you ran the towers above, you'd be far enough away from the freeway on one hand and the neighborhoods on the other, you'd open up the views to Mount Hood and to the West Hills and the river. What a great place to live. Mere blocks from downtown, a range of services in a heritage community. Gosh, that would be terrific. And then when I looked a little further and saw, you know, most of what seems to be making up all that concrete on the East Bank is really just the on and off ramps to the Morrison Bridge. You could probably surgically remove most of that stuff. <laughs> We're doing it in Vancouver. We're taking out the loops on and off our bridges because, first of all, they're very valuable real estate parcels and you don't need them. You can handle most of the volume at slightly lower speeds Restore the Morrison to the same function as the Burnside or the Hawthorne, it would probably work. You've got opportunities all over, all over. And I really expect you to do a darn good job of them. <laughs> so my invitation to you, come on up, walk around, take a look at Vancouver, and then come back down and do it the Oregon way. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon, for that wonderful address. You may be an outsider, but I think if I wanted to go on a walking tour of Portland, I know who I'd ask. <laughs> My uh, question is, would you name all the bridges between Selwyn? <laughs> I'm sure you could do that. The um, question I have is, tell us about the political environment in, in Vancouver that you accomplished all this in, and since you know Portland very well, whether you think we had the political environment to accomplish the things that you mentioned. Oh. Oh. Of course you do. Of course you do. Um, <laughs> uh, if I said, well, I did, didn't I? UGB. Everyone here, anyone not know what that is? Huh. That's policy wonk stuff. You have an incredibly informed electorate. You have a newspaper that reports in detail, in de remarkable detail. You can dump on the Oregonian Willamette Week as much as you wish, or all the local weeklies, but what an informed constituency. You have uh, what we would call public servants and the technology. 
uh, that produces breathtaking work. I mean, just surely for the beauty of the maps. <laughs> Where are you, John? Uh, alone that tells you vast amounts of information. You have an ongoing debate and discussion of which this is part, uh, the very fact that this is being broadcast. I remember sitting in a parking lot in Lloyd Center waiting for a, a, some lecture at the City Club to finish just because it was so interesting. In other words, you've got the precondition for uh, having a, a good discussion, debate, and resolution. You have an informed and interested constituency. The actual structure, uh, I'm not so sure that structures make all that much difference once you've got that precondition in place. Um, one thing that I do like is that uh, Metro, for instance, um, does have a jurisdictional responsibility, but they don't get to make the local land use decisions. Nonetheless, the structure is such that you have this informed involvement back and forth. I sit as a municipal councillor, that's the body that I'm elected to, as a director of the regional district. We're responsible for operating the utilities, but also the strategic plan. So I'm always engaged in a debate and a discussion and an understanding with my colleagues at that other level. What I think, and I referenced it, of course, is the frustrations that I suspect you are feeling, um, perhaps the ambivalence between the constitution that allows for the initiatives and the direct democratic say on the part of the people and the unintended or sometimes intended consequences of what they are doing. Um, I, I was astonished, for instance, when, um, when Measure 53 failed and at the same day Deschutes County voted against sufficient local sheriff services. It strikes me that maybe people have been, their cynicism has been cultivated past the point of common sense. And, and that's a dangerous situation. Uh, and uh, of course I can't tell you what to do about it. We face some of the same issues in, in Canada, but our political culture there is sufficiently different so that um, I, I won't exactly call it a respect for politicians or the political process, but there are certainly less opportunities to intervene, which means more obligation for us to involve. But we do not do it to the same extent as you. And having watched that process, I have to say that I think there's a balance that we may have found that works better for us. Well, thank you. That leads perfectly to my question. I was going to just ask about your public involvement program. As you know, public process and public involvement is a way of life in Oregon. Yes. You've noted the challenge of dealing with highly sensitive neighbors. I wondered if you could just elaborate on your public yeah. involvement program or approach in Vancouver. Yeah, we had this, um, again, very interesting discussion at the Neighborhoods USA conference. I'm elected at large. I'm one of ten council members plus mayor, and so I don't have a constituency or ward or a district. Um, as are all my colleagues, and it immediately makes our framework obviously different. Uh, our decisions cannot really be appealed, with a very small exception. Um, and I have to say, uh, and I think I would say this in, in Vancouver as well, um, the power must reside with the elected people. You cannot share the power with the neighborhoods. Consultation is not consent. I will listen. That's my obligation. It makes for better decision making. It makes for better community. But I'm not going to give you the power. Can't do that. It's not fair to those people who didn't elect you. Neighborhood, constituency. And you will have the opportunity to make me accountable at election time. I think that is the way the system was structured and for good reason. That works. So to send out a message to the community that that you get to make the decision by the very act of listening to you probably frustrates us all. Chris Smith, club member, uh, and I'm on the, the infill density research committee right now. And uh, I'm fascinated by the fact that Vancouver has made the decision not to pursue infill, but rather to concentrate density. Um, yeah. And is that completely true and are there shades yeah. of gray there? And I think the, the main part of my question is you talked about let go industrial areas. Yeah. Portland has a very strong industrial sanctuary and is trying to preserve industrial jobs in the inner city. Uh, how does that fit together? Well, thanks for asking the question because indeed we do have infill, but I like what Earl Blumenauer always said about that. Uh, we're not increasing densities, we're, we're restoring historical population levels. And uh, I went back and looked at some of the neighborhoods in my community, and indeed that's exactly right. Population started to drop in the 1970s, and only now are we beginning to catch up. 
Uh, and infill isn't going to significantly increase population. We just had reports back from a visioning process that we go through neighborhood by neighborhood and how the results come in. Well, we may get maybe another thousand people into a neighborhood of, say, six or seven thousand over a period of 20 years, and we'll be doing good if we achieve that. Clearly, when you have 40,000 people a year coming into your metropolitan area, a year, that's, of course, people who are born, moving locally, moving nationally, moving internationally, uh, you're not going to gain a lot by spending a lot of your political energy on infill. Let go industrial. To some degree, industry will make that decision for you. We did try and hold on to our industry. We even serviced lands along the waterfront that we thought we would have no problem leasing out. No interest. No interest. They had gone out to the intermodal yards. Transportation, of course, was critical. Uh, there we were, stuck with opportunities. When the railways left, of course, then these incredible, um, off and you got them, the Macadam, the River District. Uh, you mentioned some opportunities we didn't even know we had. Conversion of old warehousing into lofts. Uh, office buildings from the 1960s, for heaven's sake. Some even from the 1970s that decided to convert to residential. So great was the demand for downtown. Uh, we just simply allowed change of use to occur. The developer could choose. You get the same amount of density for residential as you do for commercial. You make the choice. They said residential. Uh, so almost overnight, we ended up meeting our growth needs simply within a very compact area, which for obvious reasons was all desirable for other uh, transportation-related purposes. And we didn't even have to go into some of the immediate neighborhoods, which were very vigilant in making sure that disruption didn't occur. We could, in fact, stri strike a quid pro quo. Say, here's where we want to put the density, say, on a small industrial parcel. That's a reasonable amount for you to take. But by the way, we're not even thinking about touching your single-family house. I would even go further. If you think you're going to be able to stop demographic change by stopping physical change, think again. What will get you are the economics. If you put a freeze on development at the time when the pressure increases economically, the market will do it to you in ways that you won't even know about until after it's happened. By taking the pressure off, you're more likely to stabilize the community in ways that you want and at the same time still meet your regional and citywide needs. Doesn't always work, but for us, Greg Polanyi, a city club member. Uh, Your Honor, uh, you told us about no oh, freeways. Love that, Your Honor, yeah. <laughs> well, they don't honor us the in honorable, Canada. <laughs> the honorable price. <laughs> um, you told us about no freeways in Vancouver. I wonder if you would tell us a little bit about BC Transit, the West Coast Express, the C bus, and the SkyTrain, the regional SkyTrain, underground in downtown Vancouver. Oh, boy. That's why we're down here. We want to see how you do grade or above ground transit well. Because going underground for us, we had an old tunnel, old railway tunnel left over. Uh, this is really an expensive proposition. And we want to know if there are better ways to do it. And of course, everyone knows about Max. We just say about Max in passing. Max uh, Eastside gets mm, about half the ridership of one of our heavily used bus routes. West Side Max, on the other hand, I think is going to be incredibly successful. It's going to be uh, just a revelation for both sides of the Tualatin Mountains, the West Hills, I think. Uh, I know, I suspect TriMet is counting on it. Uh, what's the most cost-effective way you can do that that maximizes choice? I don't think there is a simple formula. All of BC Transit's operations, SkyTrain, C-Bus, uh, the bus system, the trolley system, all of that now will be consolidated in a new regional authority similar to TriMet called the Greater Vancouver Transportation Authority. In fact, within uh, 50 minutes that legislation will be coming down. Um, and it will mean a new era for our city, our region. Um, that's why, again, we're down here. I, Ray, would love to tell you more about it. but. The complications of it, I think I can summarize in simply saying, we've got to give more choice to the suburbs so that they can begin to shape their growth around transit. I think the Willamette Week article talking about that misses that point. Yes, if the jobs are going out to the suburbs, there are reasons for that that no amount of appeal to the city will make a difference, probably, at least for a lot of them. 
but can you in the city connect to the regional nodes based around transit? If you can, I think that dynamic is a very good one. We're seeing many signs of success in Vancouver and the region around that. Sounds like my fellow Canadian Sarah McLaughlin is tuning up here for the Lilith there. Okay. Uh, she's trying to tell me something, I suspect. Yeah. Uh, my name is Ed Marks, and I'm a city club member, and I'm also a builder and developer. Yes. And uh, as a developer, I know that developers don't have any money at all that doesn't come from our customers. Oh, yes. Uh, Three-part question for you. Uh, all of those amenities that you said were developer paid for, who do you think ultimately pays for them? Yeah, three sources. Se can, second, can, oh, okay, second question is, do you suppose that that affects the affordability of housing? And third question is, do, do, you, suppose, do you suppose that there are people who would uh, do without those uh, amenities if they could afford a place to live? Okay, good questions, all of them. The cost can come from three places. It can come out of your profit, it can come out of the land that you buy, or it can come from the consumer. It will probably come from a mix of those three and it will be dependent on the market and the risk that you take and the deals that you strike to determine what that mix will be. Okay? It just doesn't come from the consumer though, with respect. Most of it in fact over time will come out of the land, more likely, and it's key to note here that the mega project land was gotten cheap. In one case the railway of course had it as a land grant from the middle of the 19th century. In the other case, the province sold it off cheaply and paid for the remediation costs because they knew that the investment value was more important than simply what they sold the land for at that time. So in that case, it came out of the land cost. Would someone, of course, choose housing that's cheaper if they had no alternative at all? Obviously, that's a fraction of the market, not the one that we're dealing with. The question is, can you appeal to the market that needs the housing and is prepared to pay what is the market price for it? The answer, of course, is yes. What do you need to make a profit to pay for those densities, uh, pay for the amenities? Probably sufficient density. So what's the density that you need that makes those amenities work? Should you not provide the amenities? Then the neighborhoods have a right to say, why should we carry the cost of growth? Anyway, a lot of it can be provided by you that will add value. That's my key point. That park is going to add value to what you're selling. You have an interest in providing it. It's a win-win. And that's what we looked for. We were not prepared to say that we're going to demand of you no matter what you can afford. What we wanted to say was what's the fair public investment for your private investment. So far, we think we've done a pretty good job at finding it. What it will work for you, I can't say. But I think it's worth the exploration because you want that win-win. Uh, Gordon, I'm Ted Falk, and I'm the chair of the City Club Committee that's studying residential infill in the City of Portland. And uh, we had the, the, the same privilege that this audience is, is having. Of, of, uh, we heard you speak uh, a couple of months ago, and we also had a privilege that this audience doesn't have, which is seeing all your wonderful slides of, of Vancouver, which uh, uh, helped take the relief off of the overstressed visual imagination. But uh, in addition to the slides of the uh, mega projects that you've described for us today, you, you, you showed, us, showed us a number of very interesting pictures of some of the uh, uh, established streetcar uh, neighborhoods in Vancouver, which are a lot like uh, uh, Portland, uh, many Portland neighborhoods. And so I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what we could learn in Portland about how these established uh, neighborhoods uh, handle the, the pressures as uh, infill or other types of, of residential projects come to them? Boy, well, one thing that we did do um, was simply to encourage the provision of housing on top of uh, retail along major arterials, basically where the streetcar villages were, and I'm seeing examples of that now, um, Irvington, just across from the Holiday Market. Chances are your zoning probably already allows that, and now it's a case of trying to make those numbers work. Uh, I suspect they will. Again, if the prices that I'm seeing condominiums go for here as a reflection, I suspect there is a, a great market for that. A lot of it, you know, is decisions that will be made simply because uh, people will pursue common sense choices, and a lot of that is around secondary suites, mother-in-law, whatever they, the term is you use down here, grandfather suites. Um, granny suites? Granny. Granny flats. There you go. Yeah. Um, 
And we don't really have a good hold on that ourselves. We just knew we estimated around 26,000 illegal units. Definitely a reflection of what people really wanted, regardless of what they said they wanted. So we tried to find a way of legalizing all of that. We do have some modest infill, um, you know, where garages would have gone to. And, and my guess is, is that if we can get enough working examples of that in a comfort level for people, that we will see uh, more and more of it. But, you know, we're going to find it in surprising places. I'm willing to bet, here's a prediction for you, the people building these 5,000, 6,000 square foot houses out there uh, on your urban fringe, I see castling occurring, the big, big house in the 10-acre lot just um, around where the UGB is concerned. I suspect you come in earlier, people are bu still building these very large houses. Conversion, conversion. I, th I think you'll find those become mini apartment buildings over time. That's my guess. I think we're going to see it in Vancouver. Yeah. Ah, if the, when the pressure is there, as the gentleman said, if the market isn't providing it because they can't afford it, people will still find places to live. The question for you is whether, if that's not what you want, what alternative you're going to give. Other than that, you know, I think we're roughly about the same place. And then indeed, Vancouver may have more to learn from Portland on how you can do it elegantly, uh, given your neighborhood structure and the opportunities that you've got here and the priorities you're putting on it. Wish I could be more helpful in that respect. And suspect if we could, uh, we'd be pursuing a lot of those things. But again, hypersensitive community. I'm afraid we're out of time. Thank you. Uh, we, we didn't hear a lot about uh, infrastructure or zoning changes, but you told us what it was like to live in a dense city, and we appreciate that and giving us some, some thoughts as to how we might move there. Cynicism cultivated beyond the point of common sense. I guess we need to cultivate cynicism to the point of common sense and no further. That'll be our challenge. Thank you very much.